I'm recording there, I'm recording there, I'm recording everywhere. Now is when you're getting chummy, cat. Jesus. And a plane. This makes sense. <laughs> I, I'm already losing it, I think. Oh God, and I, I feel, I feel drunker. Sip. Yep, I feel drunker than I've ever felt and I haven't had a drop, okay. <laughs> This is not helpful. Oh, less of the less of the balls there, buddy. Come on. This is a fun treat for the, anybody watching. The, <laughs> yeah. Enjoy my cat's asshole. Enjoy. All right, here we go. Let's just get into it. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of True Crime and Cocktails, Famous Fatalities Edition. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash, and as always, I am joined by my co-hostess with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How you feeling? <laughs> Today... <laughs> Today is just feeling... There's, there's a lot of, like, manic, I think, in the air. Uh, we did record the two lives today. Yeah. I shouldn't say record. We we did the two lives. Um, we recorded a couple little extra videos that we needed in between. Now we're recording this, which this is a beast of a case. It gives yeah. you wouldn't, you wouldn't yeah. think it does, but it does. And so um, I'm just feeling a lot of manic energy everywhere. And so I'm not sure what's happening. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, um, this is, you know, it's funny because in the last episode I talked about how it was going to be my last day in dry January and I, my math was completely wrong today. I'm, I'm still in dry January. This is of yeah. course, January 31st. We're recording this episode and that is relevant because, uh, I'm, I am thankful that I'm not drinking because I feel like it would just <laughs> plummet me into a place that not only would be not fun well, to listen to for anybody, but I, I, uh, I don't know that I can function. I feel heavily intoxicated and I have not taken a drink in, you know, a month. So yeah, we're, we're running on adrenaline and dreams at this point. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I was up very late, um, doing the last of my research and, uh, I thought back to the last time I was like underslept and felt really manic and weird. And that, I don't know if it was the last time, but one of the first times would have been a death in Oslo. Yeah. So in a nod to that. Choo-choo! Oh, <laughs> no! Ladies and gentlemen, Hi. please welcome to the show. Friend of the podcast, it's Brandy, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Oh, this bitch is happy to be here. Oh my God. She, you, I, if, for those of you who are listening and not watching, Christy yeah. took a sip of her drink and recoiled so badly. <laughs> I, I was about to ask her, she was talking and I was like, oh, you got to, the next thing you got to ask her is what the heck is she drinking? The answer is a friend of all of ours, dear old friend, Brandy. The problem is I've done Brandy dirty this week, which is normally the other way around. I thought for fun because sometimes sure. sometimes i like a cherry whiskey coke this is a cherry brandy coke ah and i thought sometimes i like to put a little lime juice in it just to like kick it up well i think i got a little heavy-handed or didn't mix it properly so that felt like all i got was lime it was intense and so <laughs> for the video yeah there was some recoiling but we'll we'll see what happens we're, it's just, today feels like a weird day and the case has me very like, ah, I love that I can't think of the best way to put it, but like, sup Holmes? Like, you know, like I'm feeling really like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit, there's a little gangsta that's going to come out. You're a little street right now. I'm going to, this is going to be the most street I've ever been. And I'm worried wow. about that. So listen, why dear I listeners, you know, friend. yeah, exactly. Listen, don't write the letters. Okay. You know that we're not problematic. 
she's under the influence of, of a lot of deep research into a lot of, you know, extreme gangs. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, of course, this episode, of, of course, is Tupac Shakur. Now, again, when we started this season, yeah. we were talking about who are we going to have to cover in the famous fatalities. My number one choice, Brittany Murphy. Christie's number one choice, Tupac, which, again, shocked both of us. Um, but I am yeah. super excited to get into it. I should also yeah. I should also just add just to just to like add again to like paint the picture of our true like true chaotic um manic mania. Manic mania feels like Ooh. a double doesn't matter. Um <laughs> I shot night shoots all this week on my on my TV show that I'm on and night shoots they just you just get discombobulated because you're used to working early hours. You're you're used to going to work probably yeah. at like six o'clock, you gotta be there. So you're, you're used to like a 4 a.m. wake up sometimes for the most part. Um, and so then when you ha don't show up to work until 1.30 and you're working into the night and you do that and you're, you're in the night and then it's, you're sleeping in the day, it's just like you just get, you just get, you feel for lack of a better term, like you start to feel unhinged. Yeah. And so that on top with our, of our Patreon launch, which of course launched February 1st, which we're so excited about. Yeah. All the bonus episodes. If you haven't checked it out yet, give it a look, give it a listen, see see what you think. We're very excited to be offering all of those kinds of uh, bonus content options for our dear fans and listeners. Um, between those two things, yeah. And then we we basically scheduled today, thing after thing after thing after thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am I am on another planet, and so I like <laughs> that you you're on the street, and I'm on planet mars that's what's basically yeah. happening you've got it's mork yeah. and mindy is what i'm saying oh. if mindy was a hardcore rapper <laughs> now that is a remake i'd like to watch no don't ever it's, remake anything that has robin williams in can't. it can't no you just can't. uh but no that's the show i want to see and you know what i think it was like the manic energy lack of sleep I was like, oh God, I'm just, I just, oh, I don't know. How, what am I going to do? And then it was like, well, the answer is get that warm hug on the inside, bring your best bitch along and see what happens. I yeah. mean, who are we kidding? Brandy's my second best bitch. Obviously you are my first Thank best bitch. Thank you so much. Thank you, of course. Yes. <laughs> if I was some sort of like head of like a street gang, I would of course have my best bitches. Yeah. And you would be you would be my number one and brandy would be number two yes i love it and then they'd have to arm wrestle for number three yeah and, and i say good luck to them good positions luck. of <laughs> good luck beyonce and rihanna <laughs> oh right. oh but if lizzo gets in there oh but God. also taylor swift because you love her too oh i do and i Kelly Clarkson, you know how I love this Kelly Clarkson. This is going to turn into a big girl fight. You know what? But if I know anything about us, there's not going to be any fighting. We're not going to allow it. It's just going to be a really big girl gang. <laughs> I think it's time. Yeah. I think it's time. Yeah. No more rankings. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, no I mean, rankings. we'll tell everybody we're all on the same, the same level. We just, we're all equal. But then I'll look at you and be like, obviously. Yeah. And I'll just wink. We, we yeah. know. And yeah. Brandy will know in her little Brandy <laughs> knows everything before I, I even know it <laughs> in her tiny, bitter heart. She knows. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So of course we are going to be talking about Tupac Shakur, uh, his of course, technically unsolved death to this day. Yeah. It's technically unsolved. Although of course there's lots of theories, lots of craziness to get to. Um, but I got to ask, obviously, you know, you, as you told me, you texted me very early this morning and yeah. you said, you think that you may have over-researched for the first time. And I said, I didn't realize that was a possibility. And you yeah. said, neither did I. Um, <laughs> but I've got to ask, because yeah. I know you went head first. You told me that you've been, you, you watched Poetic Justice, for example. I right? did. I did. Yeah. I felt like if I was going to watch anything that he had done, he had done a right. few movies. I was going to go just like head first with some Janet that felt the right. And uh, Regina King is in it. And that's what sold me. I was like a hundred percent. I have to go there. Yeah. Um, I did also watch a six part A and E 
biography series called Who Killed Tupac? Um, that it was it was very informative. It was like a theory of ev- on every episode they would go into and like research the theory and disprove or not. Um, the only thing is it was hosted by a civil rights attorney who only had one volume and it just felt like he shouted at us the whole time. And it was just like, just dial it back, sir, dial it back. But his passion, that's what it was. It was his passion. Of course. Um, I also watched uh, another documentary that was called Murder Rap Inside the Biggie and Tupac Murders uh, from 2015. So that right there is a solid eight hours of some Tupac viewing plus the two hours of poetic justice. Uh, Also when I'm watching documentaries to do research, I'm pausing every couple minutes to make sure I'm getting notes, get the right screenshot so I can see the information. They're not clearly showing me. So I know what to look up later. So sometimes it takes me way longer to watch some of this stuff. Right. I also, because it was Tupac who I didn't know much about him going into this, which is crazy that he was my choice, Uh, but I don't regret it at all. Um, Oh, I should also say I did read a book. There are many out there about him. I read Tupac Shakur, The Life and Times of an American Icon. Um, But I also thought for fun, while I'm making my notes, just put on a little Tupac. Oh, have a little Tupac to guide me in my notes. He has many albums. I only uh, listened to two, but I'm going to tell you, I, I've i always loved California Love. It oh, was yeah. the only song of his that I've ever known. Um, and now I listen to All Eyes on Me and Me Against the World. And now All Eyes on Me was such, I mean, both were decent, but it was such a great time it took me back to like when I was into like Dr. Dre and Ludacris, Missy Elliott, DMX, Ice Cube, like all of these. And so it was just a nice like throwback for myself just to have him there, you know? Yeah. Did you listen to any of those other artists as well? Like you, you were listening to the Tupac. Did you branch out into any of those other people you were just talking about? Um, I, ha- I have all of them in my iTunes. Oh. I have not listened to them, some of them in the last like decade or so. Right. But like Missy Elliott is somebody who's always like high on the rotation because I've always loved her. And uh, You Can Do It by Ice Cube is among my favorite songs that have ever occurred because he has an energy that I I am drawn to. I don't want to see photos of him smiling. Whoop, 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 whoop. Blanche alert, Blanche alert. <laughs> <laughs> there she yeah. is. There's our girl. Yeah. 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 He's just, he's got an energy that I respond to and he yells about something. We watched 21 Jump Street the other day and he was in that and he yelled at them and my heart just went, whoa. (laughs) I, you know, it's funny. I love this because I know that obviously he has that way about him, but I don't know if I've ever told you this now, of course, this is me with my weird Hollywood life. Yeah. Um, But I was actually at a charity event where he was being honored. And ironically, I somehow was in the front (sighs) row. I don't know how this happened. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, so- I have a lot of questions. Was he angry? Was his brow furrowed? Did he shout at anyone? <laughs> you know, I, I, yes and no to all of those at the same time, kind of. Okay. So there's this organization in, in Los Angeles called LA Family Housing, and they actually do amazing work because there's a huge, huge homeless population in Southern California, but especially in Los Angeles. And they do amazing work creating affordable housing and helping people transition into um, different housing and get permanent housing. And, and it's, it's, oh, these, these charity events that they hold are 
so moving and they bring in people that they've helped and and it's everybody cries and it's it's a beautiful oh. thing but ice cube is actually a huge supporter of theirs and has been for years oh. and so they were honoring him and he spoke and he was quite serious yes um so i think he kind of oh. technically did i wouldn't say he necessarily shouted but he mm. definitely spoke with passion um but it's so funny because it was like seeing him in a very different light because i think a lot of people maybe kind of think of him in the what you see in in the movies like you see him yes. in like friday or whatever or your yes. perception of him as a rapper um and he was you know in a tuxedo you know accepting a, oh. an award and, and speaking in a really lovely way about the the great work that this charity does so you know through a different lens he contains multitudes is what i'm saying he's like a cake he's got layers you know absolutely yeah. yeah, I actually was like very impressed by him. He was actually like very well spoken and and um, because sometimes look, oh God, I'm not even drunk and I'm like, let's spill the tea. Sometimes you go to things, you go to Ice charity tea. things. Oh um, <laughs> my Don't slip on the ice cube. Yeah. Um, sometimes you go to charity things and there'll be famous people who kind of speak or whatever, and then you're you kind of are like you listen to them and you're like, how connected is this person to this really? But he really did seem very passionate about the organization. Oh. He really like, really excited about the work that they do and, and seemed very knowledgeable about it. So I did really, I really did find him what he said very moving, genuinely, so. That's great. Yeah. I mean, doesn't really do it for me, but. <laughs> I get it. I get it. You want him to be no, angry. No, yelling. I, yeah. I guess, I mean, do I want more people interested in like helping make the world a better place? Absolutely. Yeah. But when I want a bad boy, <laughs> uh -huh. that's not the time to start thinking of others. <laughs> What I'm hearing is, is that your fantasies do not involve philanthropists, and I respect that. <laughs> I mean, I guess it depends on the the person, but I guess, I guess I'm my my dream is Ice Cube, the myth, not the man. <laughs> I, I'm not even sure what that means at this point. Not either, but I somehow really get it. I'm not sure about it, but also I feel it in my soul. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean. I get that. But that's also yeah. when, oh, now I can't, I, I have to say it now, even though we're going to get a lot of letters about this. But this is like when I had that crush on Heath Ledger's Joker. And I wasn't like, oh. it wasn't Heath Ledger as the Joker. And then people were like, you can't have a crush on the Joker. He's terrible. And yes, yes, now I know that. Now, when I look at the Joker, I'm like, no, I don't have a thing for him. But I was at a very low point in my life. <laughs> and I was like, gosh, I just feel like the Joker would do anything for you. Now, of course, I recognize that the Joker is a terrible partner. I get it. But there was a time where I was like, but I feel like he would like probably cut someone for me. He wouldn't. I know more about the comics now than I did then. So I get it. I was naive before. I have said multiple times, I could be a mobster's girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> like there are moments where I'm like, I could turn a blind eye. I could have people like, it's, it's the power. It's like, I could, I could be on the side of that power. But I think I'm also like transitioning to like, fuck being his girlfriend. Like, I want them to want to be the one with me, be with me because I'm the one in power. Ah, I see. And this is where the therapy goes in this episode today. Yeah. Just like she wants, uh, there are times where it's like, yeah, she wants power. Not right now. Right now. I just, I think I just want fries. <laughs> Oh, amen to that. Amen to that. Very wise. Very wise. Well, I too note, have a lot of layers. <laughs> Don't we all, baby? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Oh. Yes. I love it so much. Okay. Well, look, we've got lots to get through. So we're going to jump right into it. Of course, we are talking about 
Tupac Shakur to give you a little bit of backstory for those who don't remember. Cause I also was like, gosh, how old was I when this happened? I remember it, but I was quite young. So just to yeah. refresh everybody's memory and for anybody young, who's like, I don't know who you're talking about whatsoever. Yes. In September 1996, rapper and actor Tupac Shakur died after being gunned down on the Las Vegas Strip. In the 25 years since, no arrests have been made despite the numerous theories about the shooter's identity. So who is responsible for the death of Tupac? Was it someone from the East Coast rap feud? A rival gang member? Or could it have been the very man who was in the car with Tupac when he was shot? (gasps) Wow. And then, of course, there's the people that think he's still alive, but we'll get to that later. They're um, they're on my list. Yep. Yeah, I'm sure of it. I'm <laughs> sure of it. Um, gosh, now I'm just realizing now that I'm looking at these notes, he was 25. Yeah. Isn't that horrifying? My goodness. Uh, 100%. Plus, I have so many notes on things that were done in his life and mostly like while he was famous, which is the span of like four years. So it's insane that so much went down in such a small time. Um, I did write just a small little bio, one may say, uh, to give people like an insight into him uh, just overall. Yeah. Uh, So bear with me. Uh, Lassane Parrish Crooks was born June 16th, 1971. His mother would later change his name to Tupac Amaru after she joined the Black Panther Party. She then, at that time, changed her name from Alice to Afeni. Uh, Tupac would take his surname from his stepfather, Matulu Shakur, who was a member of the Black Liberation Army, who was sentenced to 60 years in prison for his involvement in an armored truck robbery in the early 1980s. Whoa. Uh, born in New York, Tupac and his family moved to Maryland, where Tupac attended the Baltimore School of Arts, where he met a young drug dealer by the name of Jada Pinkett. Stop. The only way I found out she was a drug dealer in school is because she's the one who said it. Wow. They had a friendship. She said it was never more than a friendship, but they had a very deep friendship Will Smith was said to be jealous of Tupac. So I'm just saying. Uh, In 1990, Tupac uh, became a dancer and roadie for the group Digital Underground. People may know them uh, for the song The Humpty Dance. Oh, yes. Uh, He quickly made his recording debut in 1991 on their song Same Song. Months later, he landed a record deal and his first album, Tupacalypse Now, debuted. He would later release a total of 11 platinum albums, four during his career, seven released posthumously. Wow. To date, Tupac has sold more than 75 million albums worldwide. So wow. that's- And he died when he was 25. That's crazy. 25. Um, oh boy. So there is so much. So- I ended up having to skip out of some things because some things didn't feel as relevant because this this guy had so much going on. Yeah. So October 1993, Tupac uh, did a concert in Atlanta. Him and his entourage are driving to the hotel when they see two drunk white guys attacking a black motorist at an intersection. Tupac approaches the men Words are exchanged, things get heated, guns come out, and the white guys are shot and wounded. It turns out those two white guys also happen to be off-duty cops, uh, which they did not disclose at the time of the incident. So Tupac was arrested and charged with two counts of aggravated assault. Whoa. However, the case started falling apart The cops, who were named Mark and Scott Whitwell, had said that Tupac shot first, but witnesses said it was the other way around. In the police report, the Whitwells wrote, quote, and they used the actual word, I will not because I refuse, N-words came by and did a drive-by shooting. 
in a legit police report, which is outrageous. And then if things didn't, it weren't already on shaky ground, it came out that the guns that the Whitwells used had been previously seized from a drug bust and then stolen from an evidence locker of another police department. So for the Atlanta police department to save themselves the embarrassment, they dropped all charges against Tupac. Yeah, I bet they did. Jeez. However, now we're at a point where he's feeling kind of like he's God because he got these charges taken away. He did nothing wrong in this situation. Um, he was trying to defend someone and he was trying to defend himself in the end. And so he did nothing wrong, but he came out of it like, look at these cops. They got in trouble. I didn't. So he's suddenly now he's got nothing to lose. Well, shoot to November of that same year, 1993. So we're looking at like just a few weeks later, a 19 year old named Ayana Jackson was introduced to Tupac. She later claims that he pushed her head onto his penis while they were on a dance floor at a club. According to her court testimony and numerous witnesses, she essentially just blew him in front of everybody and there was no forcing whatsoever. They go back to his hotel room and have consensual sex. Okay. Three days later, she goes to his hotel room, starts giving a massage, and then suddenly two of his friends enter the room, at which point their stories change. He says at that point he was like, screw this, I'm out. He was high and very drunk, so he went and passed out on the couch. Uh, his two friends remained in the room. He woke up to this girl screaming at him, how could you let them do this to me? She said, "You, this isn't the last you're going to hear of me. She went to the cops and said the three of them had raped her. The Tupac and two members of his entourage were charged with sexual abuse, sodomy, and illegal possession of a firearm. Oh. So we're going to keep that in mind while we move on to the next, because we're going to come back to that one. Yeah. A year goes by. Now we're looking like November of 94. Around 11.30 p.m., Tupac and his friends are trying to go to Quad Studios, a recording studio that's around um, Times Square in New York. Uh, they buzz to come in. A few minutes later, the night manager realizes that they hadn't come up yet. So he checks the security cameras and he sees Tupac standing up against a wall talking to someone. So he's like, oh, okay, he's just taking his time. Let's it go. Well, what he didn't see on the cameras was that three men in army fatigues, one was outside and followed them in when they came in the building and two were waiting in the lobby, ordered them to the floor, but Tupac resisted. He was shot once in the arm once in the thigh, once in the groin, and twice in the head. That is a total of five bullets that he took. God. The people got away with $40,000 worth of Tupac's gold chains and a ring. 911 was called, and the three cops who arrived were the same three who helped Ayana in the rape case and testified on her behalf. So at the time in this studio, up in one of the top floors, Notorious B.I.G., a.k.a. Biggie, and producer Sean Puffy Combs uh, were upstairs. Tupac's informants told him that Puffy knew about the ambush and didn't warn him. This makes Tupac paranoid. He starts thinking, they have it in for me. They didn't save me. There's no one I can trust. So this moment was kind of like the catalyst that made Tupac break with East Coast and kind of push him over more to West Coast. So despite having been shot multiple times, which because of being so paranoid and terrified for his own life, he decides to check himself out of the hospital less than 24 hours later to go stay with a friend's house. Who was the friend? Just for everybody's fun sake, because this was shocking to me, Jasmine Guy. That's a random one. It is a random one. I loved A Different World, so I yeah. love that she's uh, coming in. Yeah, wow. So uh, despite being in this condition, 
Tupac still had to go to court days later so he could get the verdict on the case from the year before. He was offered a mistrial because the prosecution had withheld so much evidence from the defense, but he refused to accept it because he wanted to clear his name as he was adamant that he was innocent. There was no semen found. Uh, it seemed like there were no forcible entry anywhere, that kind of thing. So um, he just kind of ran with it. But to me, I read part of his what he said to the judge, and it felt very like he was standing up for himself but he came off a little too cocky. Um, the two other guys with him, one was sentenced to four months in jail. One pled guilty to sexual misconduct and got probation. Tupac pleaded not guilty and received 18 months to four and a half years in jail. <laughs> so he gets taken to Rikers. He's there for a few weeks he gets moved to a maximum security facility called Clinton Correctional Facility. At this time, he has the number one album. It's his third album that went platinum. And somewhere in all of this mess, it wasn't 100% clear, he met and married a woman named Keisha Morris. <laughs> so Tupac had Keisha reach out to the head of Death Row Records, who is Suge Knight, and Suge Knight had asked Tupac to join Death Row Records years before, but Tupac said no. But now Tupac's like, hey, if you can get me out of here, I'll go wherever you want me to go. So Suge Knight, <laughs> who we will get into, uh, at this, so at this point, like Tupac's in jail, he is absolutely hating it. I don't know if anyone's ever loved prison, but like he was in a very violent prison. He'd been in there for 11 months. He was just not happy. So he was also nervous. He didn't know who he could trust. He felt betrayed by the East Coast people. So he'd had no family. Death Row was offering him a family. Shug made a couple of visits to Tupac, eventually gave him a handwritten contract where he promised to release him in exchange for Tupac releasing three albums with Death Row Records. So between Suge and the uh, label Interscope, they put up nearly $2 million and got Tupac released. He left prison October 95, and shortly after, Keisha fired for annulment. Okay, hold on. This, yeah. is, this, is, this is wild. So yes. How can you just raise money and get somebody out of jail? It, is it just that they paid for lawyers to, to file appeals? Or like, how does that even work? I want to believe that's it, but I don't really they know. They didn't get into it. Hmm. It that's was so just a lot of, they paid to get him out. So it's, I, yeah, uh, there's still a lot of questions that I have about what happens. Yeah. I also like how quickly he met somebody, married her, and then she's like, ah, I'm good. That's and fired for an annulment like over a year later. But he spent pretty much all of their marriage in prison. Right. But, you know, sure. Was, do you know if they had a prenup? I mean, now I'm just, like, that feels like. I kind of get the feeling that she just more than willingly bowed out at that point. Huh. I think, I think, I think she was genuinely in it for the love. Wow. I think she met him. There was a connection, there was something, and I know because I've seen photos and when I close my eyes, I still see his eyes. His eyes were very brown. One may say chestnut. Nope, Chrissy. <laughs> okay, he was an attractive man. Blanche has got a Blanche, okay? <laughs> Blanches be blanching. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I can't, I can't help who I am. Uh, so I get it, she would be drawn to him. His eyelashes were so thick, I can't, nope. <laughs> Um, they were like a curtain. They were just, no. Uh, so I think she was drawn in. He was very charismatic. And then next thing you know, it was like, we're in love. What do you do when you're young and in love? Quickly get married. And then sure. he goes to prison. And then right. suddenly it's just like, I'm sure after a year in prison, he was a different person because she didn't know him too much when they got married. So fair point. Yeah. All right. So Suge Knight, Death Row, Interscope, they somehow get this money together and they somehow get him out of jail yeah okay yeah 
So prison, rather, I should say, rather than jail. Right. Anyway, continue. Uh, so Suge Knight, he was born Marion Knight. His childhood nickname was Sugar Bear, which is where I'm assuming Suge came from. Uh, but according to my notes, Sugar Bear, he was not. <laughs> Even in my notes, I cracked myself up, but also not funny, Christy. Uh, he was like known it. for his violence and temper. For example, Suge, which I still feel like I'm not, uh, I don't feel like I'm cool enough to be able to just get away with calling him Suge, but <laughs> I'm going to anyway. Uh, so Suge wanted Dr. Dre on his death row label, but Dr. Dre was with Ruthless Records. So Shug confronts the head of Ruthless Records, who was Easy E. I don't know if anyone remembers Gimme That Nut. I love that song. It was a very big uh, song at the bar here. Um, he, so he confronts Easy E with bats and pipes and threatens to harm Easy E's mother if he doesn't release Dr. Dre from his contract. Jesus. Uh, I'm not sure how true that story is. But Easy E did file a lawsuit against Suge, claiming he was forced to sign a release under duress. <laughs> and Suge is not denying it. So uh, Suge ruled death row with an iron fist. Um, an artist known as Jewel, with two L's at the end, not the, my hands are small, I know. <laughs> that why that song? Why was that my choice? Um, not that jewel. Uh, yeah. But a, a woman claimed that she uh, had tried to leave death row and Suge pulled a gun on her. Uh, Vanilla Ice had an encounter with Suge and said he felt very threatened. Now, a quick aside about Vanilla Ice. I know you are, tend to be the one with the stories, but I'm going to say this. I met him once. I remember that. I was with a boyfriend at the time who I'm assuming he isn't listening to this, but he wasn't the nicest. He was kind of just an idiot. Um, but I, in fairness, I dated him because he was six foot eight. <laughs> and I was young and like, they grow them that tall? Like I had sure. no idea. Yeah. Um, and we found out that he was going to be uh, in Regina, capital of Saskatchewan. Um, and so we're like, well, we need to get tickets. We need to go to this show. And we went. And I think to this day, I might still have the towel that his drummer gave me and then awkwardly tried to sign. It didn't work out. Uh, I think I also got a drumstick, but that's not the point. Um, so afterwards, they're like, well, we're all just going to hang out at this, like, I think like almost like an after club kind of thing downstairs. And so I'm like, this guy who worked the event went around and was like pointed to all these girls and we're like, yeah, you can go, you can go. And he got to me and let's face it, I'm at a Vanilla Ice concert. Ah, uh, the girls were out to play. So he looks at me and he's like, yeah, you go. And my dumb, dumb boyfriend at the time who was way back far in the crowd was like, I'm with her. So he used me to get in. So we get in, we go downstairs and there he is. Now this I'm going to say it was probably like 2002, 2003-ish. Sure. And I, who didn't love Vanilla Ice? I had the Vanilla Ice rap game that had like a plastic yellow microphone that when you turned it on, it just did like the beatboxing. But I was so intimidated by the sound, I could never play. <laughs> <laughs> so I loved Vanilla Ice. So I was here for it. So I'm like, here we go. And we go downstairs and he's sitting there and y'all, he looked the same as he did in the videos in the early nineties. And my heart stopped and I didn't know what to say. And I was like, I'm dying. And like, he played some like newer songs that we were all like, oh yeah. And then he played like the classic stuff and we went wild and it was just such a great time but he's sitting there and I'm like oh my god I want to talk to him but I can't you can't you can't just go up and talk to vanilla ice well I was wrong my boyfriend which I will clarify again we did break up 
We have not spoken since. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> uh, so we go up to Vanilla Ice. He holds his hand out to me. I take his hand. We shake hands. Huh. I'm like, that was such an amazing show. Such a huge fan. I was losing my mind. And then my idiot boyfriend comes up from behind, sticks his hand out to shake his hand and goes, it's really nice to meet you, Mr. Ice. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And that was my moment. I wanted to crawl inside myself. I'm like, how do you, Mr. Ice. how do you come back from that? I'm like, you know, that's not actually his name, right? Like his mother didn't name him Vanilla. Like, what are you doing? And like, he legit just thought that was how it is. And I'm like, oh, no. Well, oh. we broke up not long after. It was, it actually had nothing to do with that. But the point if is, it, it, it you should know what? have. <laughs> how did Rob Van Winkle handle that moment? Was, was it like, did he look like, uh, or was it just kind of like he gets it all the time? That motherfucker was graceful as shit. <laughs> He took his hand, shook it, and went, yeah, thanks, man. And, like, looked at me, and we shared a brief moment in that, like, split second of eye contact. I was like, that was Vanilla Ice telling me, what the fuck are you doing with this? <laughs> like, that, yeah. was, that was his moment of, like, are you kidding me? You're playing it cool, and you bring in this fucking idiot? And I was like, yeah. And so I should have break, broken up with him, but spoiler alert, he dumped me. Not the point. <laughs> Listen, we the journey that we're on makes no sense yeah. until we're off of it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He, uh, his reason for dumping me. Yeah. That's where I already sidetracked. Yeah. He didn't like that a girl liked hockey. What? Because when he was in high school, he was bullied by the local, like, teenage hockey team. And so suddenly after like, I'm assuming it was three glorious months together, he suddenly decided, oh yeah, you liking hockey is a big deal to me. Okay. And so I'm sure. like, I just did like a, let me get this straight. So you're, ma you're saying I have to choose between you and the Philadelphia Flyers. And the answer is, I chose Philly. <laughs> of course I did. And I don't regret it. Although I'd like a Stanley Cup in my lifetime. <laughs> but again, you know what? Since we're already off the rails, very quick moment of yes. therapy talk. Yes. I actually think you avoided an abusive relationship. Oh. And I'm going to tell you why. Yes. I think he was trying to exert because something that like emotional and mental abusers will do, yeah. you know, there's, there's the obvious things they'll try and alienate you and isolate you from your family, your friends, all of the above, but they can also try, sorry, my cat was made a crazy noise. They can also try to uh, control the things that you like. And that it's like, you have to like what I like. You have to do what I do. We have to do the same things. And I think it was a test in the fact that you like pushed back and you were like, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm fine. Bye. Um, I think you really dodged a bullet. So I think at the end of the day, he didn't dump you. You got out of there. And I love that my take from all of this, Vanilla Ice saved my life. <laughs> so if you're listening, yeah. Mr. Ice. Oh, okay. Just know that wasn't my idea. I don't even have to say it. I saw it in the brief look he gave me. Yeah. They shook hands. He looked at me and gave me just that brief, like, really? And it was like, yeah, that should have been my moment to look at it. But you're right. He was testing the waters. Yep. And I dipped a toe in and went, not for me. If you had said, okay, I'll, I'll not watch hockey anymore. Then he would have been like, okay, if I can get her to do that, then what else can I get her? What to else? Do? What's next on the chopping block? What else can I control? Suddenly I'm not able to listen to vanilla ice anymore. Well, suddenly it's going to be a problem that you even wanted to go to the concert. It becomes, it's mm. a domino effect. Trust me. 
Yeah. Yeah. That makes, that makes sense to me. See, you are good at this. I've just gone through a lot of therapy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know, it feels right. Like you live and you learn, but see, that's the thing. This shows that you're not, you're an active participant in the therapy. Yes, that's true. Because while you do, uh, while you are there listening and participating, you're also like absorbing. Yeah. And you're like, how can I put this to use later on? Yeah. Which is a that real takes gift. takes time too. That takes time. Yeah. It took like, it took time for that. Like there was time where it was like, I'm not doing that. I w- I've never done that. And then, you know, you get to a point where you're like, oh, I've done that. I'm still doing that. Stop. Just stop. You yeah. just get to a point where you're just tired. And then you're like, I have to just accept that I... I have to take this help. <laughs> I, and, that's, and that's the beautiful, that's when the, that's when the rebirth happens, man. You know? Yeah. I really would love to see you in a therapist position. Oh yeah. I'd love because that. I think you would knock it out of the park. Can mm-hmm. we change the judge show <gasps> to some sort of therapist and maybe instead of a bailiff, but still pajama pants. I can be like, I can be like the secretary. I offer them a water when they come in. I take notes. I kind of leave your phone, uh, the phone on my desk on to your line so I can hear everything without them knowing. And then the joke is me trying to play cool. Like, I don't know what that dude just said in therapy. And then I will be stripped of my credentials that I don't have. (laughs) Well, I mean, if it's a show. That's true. What if it's group therapy? So then you're allowed to be in the room. Oh my God. And we have somebody who has like experience and we have somebody who doesn't. So you're going to get like the really like smart, like I'd love to see you in a nice glasses. Oh yeah. Where you can like adjust them every once in a while, a nice sort of power suit. And you, you're taking notes and you're very great about it. And then you guys are having a very serious conversation. And then this a-hole leans in, chomping on her Cheetos and is like, whoa, 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 whoa. So Mark, what the fuck did you say to your wife? Like, (laughs) (laughs) when I'll be like, excuse Christy, she's a therapist in training. She's interning. I've asked you not to eat Cheetos in the session. Yeah. I'm going to need to add a robe to this ensemble <laughs> because the shirt and tie no longer works, right? If I'm therapist, but if I'm a therapist in training, yeah, but I'm going to need that robe and just like, I just, his, like the patient's awkward glances over to me with like a, uh, and you just being like, yeah, it's a safe space. And I'm just like, yeah, Mark, spill the fucking tea. You know, like that's. <laughs> yeah. I am just going to keep pitching shows. I love it. I like the yeah. idea of Christy, Christy Oxborough <laughs> confused therapist. Like I would watch that show where you're just like, wait a minute, what? Like, why would you do that? And then at the end I yeah. come in and I'm like, here's the reason why Mark's fighting with his wife. He doesn't feel like he's being heard. And at the end of the day, that connects to his relationship that he had with his father and his father never being home. His father was a traveling salesman. He spent a lot of time on the road and that was mm-hmm. before cell phones. So they only got to talk once a week. You know, he needs that, com- that, that, that constant communication with Monica. And I just think that if Monica knew that, maybe they'd be able to reconnect. And then you cry and then the credits roll. (laughs) The joke is I thought every episode would end with me on the couch. (laughs) (laughs) And then it's like, you've got your full, your uh, file folder situation, all of the different cases. And I'm an entire drawer of (laughs) my file is so big. Yeah. Where it's just like, he leaves, Mark gets up. He leaves and I immediately just get up, shuffle over to the couch and lay down and go, all right, so where were we? And you'd be like, ah, rat, fountain, I don't know, pick one. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I don't know why I'm suddenly like the, the bum that's just sitting there in my robe. That's going to be 
covered in Cheeto dust. And like, <laughs> let's, let's be honest, the entire room will be covered in the Cheeto dust. <laughs> you could use it to dust for prints. It's going to yeah. be everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. I just keep wanting to make shows. You're a, you're a producer at heart. It's a creator, a producer, a writer. Yeah. I love it. We just need to get some producers listening to this that are like, one of these days, she's going to hit on one. Oh, yeah. One day she's going to get to one where people are like, okay, we can handle her walking around in, you know, a robe eating Cheetos, yelling at a guy who's just trying to make his mental health better. I'm worried about him. Yeah. Listen, speaking yeah. of producers, music producers, Suge Knight, he intimidated Vanilla Ice. That's where we left off. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Uh, he also, uh, some guys went in to use a phone at Death Row Records. The phone was specifically meant for Suge alone. They did not know that. They used the phone, as you do, and he pistol whipped them and went to jail. <laughs> oh, my God. Jeez. Keep in mind, for those who don't know, Suge Knight is like six foot four, 300 pounds. So he is not a small person. He is a very intimidating presence already. Yeah. And then you bring in anger and it's a lot. So you got Suge Speaking Knight. Speaking of people, I need to get on my couch. You know what I mean? I need to talk about that childhood. That's what we need to dig into. Sugar Bear, what happened? What turned you from Sugar Bear to Suge? You know what I mean? There's a story there. Yeah. I wonder if we could get him on the show. Is he still alive? I'm fairly certain he's in prison. <laughs> you, you know what? I'm going to go to the limb and say he should be. Uh, <laughs> there is a point he was. We'll, I mean, we'll get into his more current life. But um, at the time, Suge Knight is the head of Death Row Records, and they're in California. And then on the other coast, you got Puffy, who is head of Bad Boy Records in New York. Right. So as you may recall from not long ago, I mentioned that Tupac was shot and robbed at Quad Studios in New York in 94. Well, four months later... Biggie, who was a member of Bad Boy Records, released a song called Who Shot Ya? Oh. He claims it wasn't anything about Tupac, but everybody who's heard it, including Tupac, was like, yeah, it was. Right. So at this point, Tupac is just, he wants nothing to do with anybody over there. He's over it. East Coast, West Coast is becoming such a huge rivalry. So August 95, there's uh, an awards call, a award ceremony, the Source Awards. Suge gets some sort of award. I think one of his albums or something, I should have looked further into that, wins. But anyway, he gets up on stage and he starts going off and he says any artist out there who wants to be an artist and stay a star and don't want to have to worry about the executive producer trying to be in all the videos and all the records and dancing come to death row well that was a huge slam at puffy because let's face it puffy puts his ass in everything so people like it, this award show happened in new york it was on puff's territory i don't know why he suddenly puffed to me he was on Puffy's territory. He was, Puffy was in the audience. So half the audience booed at this point. Less than two weeks after this event, uh, Puffy and Suge just happened to be in the same nightclub in Atlanta. A confrontation happens between their entourages. And as Suge leaves, his best friend and bodyguard, Jake Robles, is shot and killed. Oh. No one conveniently saw what happened, but Suge blames Puff's security guard, Anthony Wolf Jones. I have said this to you in private, and I'll say it now. I was in love with mob nicknames when we did Lady in the Lake. Yes. But I think a very close second or possibly a tie is rap nicknames. Like, I find it fascinating Puffy. Yeah. Like Puffy is a thing that 
you want people to call you. I mean, I do realize in the later years, he changed to P Diddy. And then I think he went to just Diddy. Yeah. I don't even know. Uh, the point is, I find some rap nicknames so amazing. And they're not just rap nicknames. It's like gang nicknames because like this guy's nickname is Wolf. It's like, oh, okay. Um, but everybody who was there says it was absolutely Puffy's security guard. So at this point, everyone's like, this is, you're either East Coast or you're West Coast. You can't be both. Right. So then uh, Tupac's album, All Eyes on Me, uh, drops. It's the first album he did for Death Row. It's his fourth album overall. It sold like 560 some thousand in the first week and is the first double album in hip hop history. Oh, wow. I which I thought was, uh, which I, th- I thought was fun. Yeah. And then a few months later, Tupac comes out with a song called Hit Em Up. In the song, uh, Tupac brags about sleeping with Biggie's wife oh boy. and threatens to kill members of Bad Boy Records, including Puffy, Biggie, and Lil' Kim, to which I say, leave her alone. What did Lil' Kim have to do with anything? Yeah. You know, but again, I love uh, Ladies Night. I believe she was in. There was a song. I think that was it. But uh, she's just so tiny and cute. Come on. Um, so in the video for Hit 'Em Up, there was an actor who, of course, looks and dresses just like Biggie. Um, this song is known as one of the most infamous diss tracks in rap history. It solidified the East versus West rivalry. This was his retaliation. Um, Biggie's wife at the time, Faith Evans, um, was featured on a song on the All Eyes on Me album. Uh, So it's obvious that they met, but she also has come out in the later years and was like, we recorded it later. Um, there's nothing that ever happened between us. I, um, oh, oh, I didn't know that Tupac was with Death Row. I didn't know there was a beef with him and Biggie. And it's like, how the fuck did you not know that? That was like huge news. But then yeah. it came out, she's saying like, oh, they recorded it like months later. And it's like, but it's clear knowledge that he recorded it a very specific like week in October. So it's like, it's obvious that's when you recorded it. Right. And people were like, oh, she would she would like disguise herself and like sneak over to his place. So it's like, who knows what happened? Oh, boy. Biggie had his side things as well. But one thing I read that made me kind of burst out laughing just in the way they worded it um, was like, well, if Tupac or if Biggie was like upset about the thought of Tupac and his wife sleeping together, he'd be super pissed if he found out that Tupac was actually sleeping with Biggie's girlfriend. (laughs) And apparently he was. Oh dear. Um, Well, listen, Yeah. on that note, I think we need to just take a very quick break. Uh, Oh, how this tangled web weaves. Mm -hmm. I cannot wait to hear more about Tupac, Biggie, the East Coast, the West Coast, all of the above. Lots more to come on the second half of this episode of True Crime and Cocktails, famous fatalities edition. Instead of unpausing, I stopped it. So mine will be in two. It's fine. I'll figure it out. I can always send you this one. Yeah. Look who's back. Why? (laughs) Why? (laughs) Ah. He All feels right. that energy that's going around. Yep. He knows. All right, here we go. All right, everyone, we are back on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails, Famous Fatalities Edition. Of course, we are talking about the death of Tupac Shakur. Um, we left off talking, of course, about the the heated rivalry between the East Coast and West Coast rappers that was going on at this time. Um, where are we going next? On this wild ride. Um, well, I'm going to say to anybody that's listening, that's like, you know what? I don't want all of this backstory on the stuff that's going on. Well, trust me, 
it all plays a part. There's a, Christy has a method to her madness. I, I trust don't you. Like when I refer to myself in the third person, but listen, maybe that's when Brandy's speaking. Oh, sure. Yeah. It's, it's Brandy coming through you. It's like your other personality. Yeah. <laughs> Get now on the I, couch. <laughs> now, I, now I feel like medium or something. <laughs> That's another show oh. entirely. Yeah, which I can't wait to pitch. Yeah. It's gonna um, be good. Talks to ghosts. Yeah, right? Uh, so we have our East Coast, West Coast rivalry. While we're also speaking rivalries, we're going to say some words that I never thought I was going to say in my lifetime, and we're going to talk the Bloods and the Crips. Great. Yeah. Gangs. We're talking about gangs. We're going to go, we're going to go gangs. So Compton is approximately 10.2 square miles. And in Compton, there are 55 gangs. (laughs) Wow. I never knew that. Yeah. Uh, So there are a lot of gangs. We're only going to focus on two. We're focusing on the Southside Crips and Mob Peru, who um, were named after a, I guess it's more Piru, sorry, um, after a street in Compton. They're essentially the Bloods. Okay. Um, They started as Mob Piru, but then they ended up uh, becoming the Bloods. Some people refer to them as both. So Suge Knight was associated with the Bloods. Uh, Tupac wasn't specifically gang related at all, but because he associated with Suge in Compton, you choose a side. You go with Suge, obviously that's where your allegiance lies. Okay. And also some Mob Piru members worked as security for Death Row Records. So April 1996, a Mob Piru named Trayvon Lane, he's at Lakewood Center Mall in front of a footlocker. He's wearing a death row medallion, which I will post a picture of. I've seen multiple pictures. It's hard to get one, a good one. But, um, you, you know, especially the rap guys like the bling. And Suge Knight had these fully, like, diamond-encrusted death row records logo medallions made that he gave to his closest friends so he had given one to this Trayvon Lane so he's at the mall and a group of crips including a guy named Orlando Anderson they beat Trayvon down and took the medallion this chain is a symbol of pride taking it is a symbol of disrespect right an informant claims that Puffy ordered or offered $5,000 to anyone who would steal a death row medallion. Interesting. So now this, oh, without them realizing it, this was essentially the catalyst to Tupac's death. So this happened, what I say, April? April of 96. We scoot to September 1996. So we're just looking a few months later. Tupac and Suge attend the fight between Mike Tyson and Bruce Seldon at the MGM Grand in Vegas. Yeah. They're sitting ringside. They've got $1,000 seats. Tyson came out to a song that Tupac wrote specifically for him. Uh, At the time, he was like one of the number one artists at the time. So he was just having his best day right yeah yeah so tyson knocked out selden in one minute and 49 seconds to show how short that is for a for a match the national anthem lasted 41 seconds longer than the actual fight whoa oh that's wild so after the fight tupac is close friends with uh mike tyson so he was already jazzed at this point So after the fight, Tupac and his entourage, including Trayvon Lane, are walking through the MGM lobby when Trayvon tells Tupac he sees Orlando Anderson, that punk who jumped him and stole his medallion months before. Tupac 
flies in a rage and immediately starts beating on Orlando, Shug, and all the rest of the entourage come and join in. The entire fight, which only lasted 12 seconds, is caught on MGM surveillance cameras. Oh, wow. Tupac and his crew immediately leave before cops are going to get involved. They head to the Luxor Hotel, which is where they always stayed when they came to town. So Tupac at the time is dating a girl named Kadada Jones. She would be the sister of Rashida Jones and the daughter of Quincy Jones. Of course. There is a whole thing about her that I don't even want to get into, but I probably will at some point. Uh, Tupac had said some not nice things um, about Quincy in the press, mainly focusing on he doesn't understand why Quincy keeps... Uh, going with white women. He didn't understand mixed racial children, like that kind of thing. So uh, Rashida Jones was not having it. So she wrote um, a letter and sent it into the magazine that his article was published in to be like, okay, so I'm one of those kids and just basically telling him what an asshole he was. Months later, He thinks he sees her at a club, approaches her to apologize because he realizes his he was being an asshole. And it turns out it wasn't Rashida, it was her sister Kadada. They dated, they were dating at the time of his death, but they apparently had only been dating for like three, maybe four months at the most. Okay. If you ask her or anyone that she has that anyone that has interviewed her, she says they were engaged when they, when he died, if you ask anyone who knew him, they knew nothing about that. They barely knew her, all of this. Interesting. Um, she also gave an interview. Apparently I'm getting into her shit now. She gave an interview once that was like, after he died, I couldn't leave my house for nine months. I couldn't talk to anybody. I couldn't do anything. I was so depressed. He was the love of my life. Well, then why is there footage of her five months after his death dancing at a party with Puffy? (gasps) Shut up. Uh Uh-huh. She also got a Tupac tattoo on her shoulder, which she has since covered with flowers. So I just feel somebody who you were like, that's the love of my life. You get a tattoo and memory of them, you're never going to cover it. So it's crazy. There was also, and I'm barely hitting on this because I didn't bother looking into it further. There was also talk of, from some of Tupac's people uh, who were around the hospital at the time after he was shot, uh, who said that Kadada told Tupac's mother that she was pregnant with his baby. She was not. Wow. But like, I don't know what's going on there, but I feel like I need to look into this woman some more. Now she would have been very young at this time, right? Um, yeah, she was like early twenties, I think. So like, who knows? I mean, I get it. Your early twenties, you meet somebody and suddenly it's like, well, that's the love of my life, but it's, there's just so many layers to it, but yeah, I don't know. So she is in Vegas at the time. They go to the fight. They end up having this scuffle at the lobby. They go back to the hotel and he tells her, I want you to stay in the hotel. Things might get a little real out there. I just, I'm worried about your safety. I want you to stay here. Uh, Tupac and Shug and the entourage were all headed to Club 662. There was going to be a charity event and Tupac was going to perform there. She was worried about his safety. She said, if you're going to go wear a bulletproof vest, to which he said, oh, it's too hot for that. Well, so they go to Shug's house to hang out for a bit and change. Then they go on to Club 662. Uh, Death Row head of security, Reggie Wright Jr., told the security that they weren't allowed guns at the club so their weapons would be waiting for them in vehicles outside in the parking lot. So now they're headed to the club. They're going down the Vegas Strip. For some reason, they didn't let... they One vehicle, there was about six in this caravan, 
one vehicle was Suge and Tupac, and that's it. The fact that the two of them were in a vehicle together is insane safety-wise. The fact that they did not have a bodyguard of any kind or that their bodyguards weren't even, had no sort of weapon of any kind is also a terrible choice. Yeah. So, and they also weren't trying to hide who they were. They're driving down the strip. They're in a good mood. The adrenaline's going from being in that fight. They're cranking the music so loud that a bicycle cop pulls them over to give them a ticket. While they're pulled over, a fan is standing on the sidewalk, looks over and goes, oh, hey, it's Tupac, and takes a picture. And that is the last known photo of Tupac, which is crazy. I do have it. I will post it. Uh, So while they're stopped, this car of women, I believe there were four of them, sees that it's Tupac and Shug, and they start shouting to them. And the guys, of course, being who they are, looked at these women and were like, hey, we're heading to this place. You should come with us. The girls were like, hell yeah, we will. And so the girls kind of pull up alongside them, but then they're like, you know what? We know where we're going. We're going to turn right uh, down this other street and we'll meet them there. So the girls pull up with the intention of turning right. And as they pull up, a white Cadillac pulls up behind them so that that car is now right beside Tupac and Shook. A black glove is seen leaning out of the back driver's side window of the Cadillac and 10 to 15 shots are heard. Tupac's main security guy, Frank Alexander, was in the car behind them. Tupac had given Frank the keys to Kadada's car and asked him to drive the members of the group, the outlaws. Um... So at this point, you've got Tupac's head of security or Tupac's main security guy who's not in a vehicle with Tupac, who has no weapon. And he had just come back from vacation when, while he was gone, he gave his radio to another guy who had not returned it. So he had no radio. So 10 to 15 shots are heard. Jeez. People who were around there said it felt like it went forever. It was loud and it just was just kept going. So um, after the shots, this car quickly turns and does a right. It does it so fast, it almost goes right into the car these women are driving as they're turning. But because the shots were heard, people in a car further back in their caravan was like, holy shit, go after them. But they also don't have weapons. So they chase after this car. This car shoots at them. And they're like, you know what? We get it. They back off that car takes off, we don't see it again. This person, um, he had, uh, he got pulled over for something and they noted the bullets, the bullet entries in his car. So I feel like it backs up the story, but the fact right. that, there was a, that there was a second shooting just like a minute later in that same area, I hadn't heard anybody mention before. Nobody right. got hurt in that one, but still. Right. So the shots ring out. Shug is just immediately in shock. Uh, w- some of the glass from the windshield hit his head and he, it cut him really deep. So he has blood pouring out of his head and Tupac's not really responding. So he instinct was like, I've got to get him to a hospital. So he immediately pulls a U-turn, but hits the median in such a way that two of his tires get damaged and the car just ends up like feet from where they were to begin with. So... Police um, try to get everybody's statements, but nobody will. Con- nobody wants to cooperate. Shug goes to the police station three days later, brings three lawyers with him, and refuses to talk. Shug says he knows who did it, but he's not going to tell police. What? So this to me is very like he knows who did it. It's somebody that he has some sort of rivalry with. And he's going to handle it on his own is kind of how I took that to be. Right. Right. So one of the members of security guard named Michael Moore had his radio 
at the time he was sitting at club 662 waiting for Tupac and everyone to show up. And he claims over the radio around the time the shots were heard that he heard somebody say, got him. Followed by someone saying, don't say nothing on the radio. Oh, and it's only his team that are using the radio. So then this is, this guy's kind of implying it's potentially somebody within their own team. Uh, this all went down September 7th, September 13th, uh, Tupac succumbs to his injuries and is officially pronounced dead. So don't worry, folks, this continues to not well, stop. I just, I just have to say really quickly that yeah, I was trying not to laugh for that last little bit because you said his other security man named Michael Moore and I was just picturing Bowling for Columbine director Michael Moore sitting in that club <laughs> getting that radio call. <laughs> and it just tickled me. It was just like the idea that his side hustle is uh, doing security for Tupac in the 90s. With uh, This was funny in my own brain. Again, I'm, I'm work from work tonight, so good luck to uh, you. Anyway. Sitting at the club in his robe with his Cheetos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fairly accurate. Okay, yeah. so this is wild. All right, so yeah. he claims he heard that on the radio. Yeah. Tupac died in hospital six days later. Yeah. My God. All right. Well, let's keep trucking through. What's yeah. next? Yeah, yeah. There. Just when you think there's not a lot, there there's still some beasts to come. And yeah. yeah, I'm playing it really fucking cool because I have something that has me screaming. But I, I feel wait. like I feel like I'm not projecting that. I'm projecting a lot of heat. Um, you seem very cool. Very, very cool. I, I never would have known. You seem all business. Wow. Like you seem like you're like, I got to get through this. Like I've got a lot to get through. I, yeah. I, that's what I feel. And then, and then oh. yeah, you are flushing, but that I'm also flushing feels cause like, doot, doot, you know, yeah. I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it, Brandy's just like giving you a wave, letting you know, like, yeah, just so you know, like, I'm here too. <laughs> he seems cool and collected, but inside She's a maniac. <laughs> so that's where we're at. I love it. So six months after Tupac's death, Biggie, who we have spoken about before, yes, also dies in an unsolved shooting in March of 1997. Years go by and a huge task force is put together that includes like Compton PD, FBI, all in an attempt to solve Biggie's murder. Apparently Biggie, it, it came out that they thought maybe a cop could be involved. And so Biggie's mother sued the state uh, and they decided we're going to make this task force. We're going to get this solved basically to prove that she doesn't need to sue us because right. it wasn't us. So in doing this task force about Biggie's murder, in comes a man with the name Dwayne Keefe D. Davis. Now, Keefe D. Uh, is the leader of the Southside Crips and the uncle to Orlando Anderson. My, my. Uh-huh. He was interviewed by cops uh, in 1997, but he lawyered up. He was interviewed again in 1998, and he said he knows Orlando was upset over the fight at the MGM, but he warned him not to retaliate. Then he claims, well, maybe Orlando was planted in the lobby in an attempt to aggravate Tupac. Who planted him there? I don't know. Maybe it was Shug. And let it go. Now, knowing that Keefe... Uh, clearly knows more than he's saying yeah. the task force sets up a massive sting operation and i'm talking this thing took years and they it, it, it had wiretaps and informants and the sole purpose was to get one of keefe's drug couriers to turn on him and they did and they got enough evidence that they brought him in in like 2008 and we're like okay here's the deal we know you know something about Biggie's death. We have all of this information on you. You could go to prison for life. 
if you tell us about Biggie, the other stuff isn't so bad. So he had a good, re- he had a big motive to finally say what he did. However, right. so people are immediately discrediting everything he said because they're like, it was either that or prison. And it's like, however, some of his facts I find are very interesting. So they go to interview him and they're like, okay, we want to talk. He was at the party that Biggie was at when Biggie left and got shot. So they're like, you were there. Like, what do you know about that night? And his quote was, that wasn't us. To which the cops go, okay, then what was? And he goes, oh yeah, that whole interview I did a decade ago, that was bullshit. So all this whole, like, I tried to calm Orlando down. I'll bet it was Suge, all of that. He's like, yeah, I'll admit it. That was bullshit. So his newer confession, he says that he met Puffy through a drug dealer acquaintance named Eric Zip Martin. Uh, Puffy told Keefe and Zip that he'd give anything for those dudes' heads. At a meeting months later, Puffy said, seriously, I need to get rid of these guys and offered them a million dollars to do it, to which Keefe responds, I would have done it for 50. Which is- That's a pretty big disparity there, okay. Yeah, Uh, I just love his boldness of like, I'm gonna admit to the cops, I would have done it for less. (laughs) So I find that interesting. Yeah. So. Puffy, of course, denies any involvement in Tupac's death. Uh, Anytime you mention it, he just says, I don't talk about nonsense. And it's like, or just say no, Puffy, but okay. Yeah. So Puffy also denies any involvement with the Southside Crips. However, it's common knowledge in the rap community that when Puffy is on the West Coast, he uses Crips as security because he got to a point where he was terrified of Suge. And so he would call people out on the West Coast and be like, "Can is it safe to come out now? And they'd be like, we've got you. It's fine. You can come out. Puffy's own bodyguard, Eugene Deal, admits that when they roll in Vegas, they usually have 30 to 50 Crips with, from Compton with them. So 30 his, to 50? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So he's, everybody is like, oh, they're, they're in the life. Um, Right. So Keefe had previously told police that he tried to calm his nephew Orlando down after the scuffle at MGM. Now he's saying he wanted to retaliate. Keefe and his crew get in a rented white Cadillac, which was rented by the driver's mother-in-law, And I was told they always, always, especially if they're planning something to go down, they always use a -a rent-a-car because any evidence they find in the car, they can't pin it on you specifically. It's a -a rent-a-car. To which I did, uh, well, that's smart. (laughs) (laughs) Again, so the driver was Terrence T. Brown Brown, which again feels like one of the more lame rap names when your name is Terrence Brown, but your mean name is T Brown. It's like, oh, okay. Um, so T Brown is driving, Keefe D's in the passenger seat. DeAndre Smith, known as Dre, is uh in the back passenger or is in the back driver, and with him is Orlando Baby Lane Anderson. So they go to Club 662, they're waiting for Tupac, they want to jump him when he gets there, but they start getting tired of waiting, so they start driving around. But all the vehicles in the caravan are very similar, make and model, so they can't see, they're also driving up and down this strip looking for them, they can't see them, and then they see a car full of girls screaming, Tupac, Tupac, Shug, oh my God, and so they do a U-turn and pull up behind this car of women. Uh, He tells it very similar to how the women told it. Uh, He said they pulled up behind the girls. Keefe was on the wrong side. 
Uh, he didn't want to have to lean over the driver. So he passed the gun to Dre, who was in the back. Dre said, no, I don't want to touch it. Orlando was like, give me that. I got this. So Orlando took the gun and leaned across Dre and shot at uh, Tupac. Keefe says in the moment of the shooting, he made eye contact with Suge. They've known each other since childhood. So in that moment, I was like, I'll bet out of shock, you hear the sound, you look where it's coming from. He makes eye contact because they're right beside each other. And I can't help but wonder if that's true, you know, deep down, he's like, well, I know who did it. Right. And I'll take care of it myself because them going to prison means nothing to me. I want them dead kind of thing. Right. Right. So uh, Keefe confirms that after the shooting, one of the cars followed them and they shot at it. Uh, they were followed by Suge's main enforcer, Alton Buntry McDonald. He's the one whose car had bullet holes in it. Uh, so Keefe's crew gets away. They park their car at a parking garage near the carriage house. They go drink and smoke weed at the hotel. The next day they take any, um, bullet casings out of the car and then just simply drive back to Compton where Orlando brags to anyone and everyone who will hear him that he shot Tupac. So uh, Keefe claims that Puffy called him and said, was that you? And that he was happy as hell. Keefe also claimed he was never paid, which is why he was finally willing to admit all of this to the cops. Rumor has it that Bad Boy Records owed the Crips a million dollars for concert security, although some say it wasn't for concert security, it was what they owed for the hit on Tupac. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, we're getting to the stuff that's ultra highlighted and starred. <laughs> So we're getting we're getting to the part that I'm was just like, why is nobody talking about this? And yeah. I guess they are in the numerous documentaries that exist about. I just hadn't paid enough attention, I guess. Sure. So after Tupac's death, like at the point of when he died, early 90s in California was just full of massive tension, especially amongst um African American males and the police, essentially. Uh, March 91 was the Rodney King incident. Uh, April, May 92 were LA riots. October 95 was OJ Simpson's not guilty verdict. October 96, there was a police raid that involved 300 officers from 10 agencies that had 40 location search warrants. So the month, like it, so at this point, things are already tense. And then you go and kill one of the most beloved rap artists of the time. So people were, especially like in and around Compton, were losing their minds. Right. So the Monday after Tupac's death, which is less than 48 hours later, the first retaliation happened. 11 attempted murders and three murders occurred in 11 days in Compton. Wow. There were so far 26 other deaths somehow trickle back and connect to Tupac's death. Whoa. Uh, including Notorious B.I.G., which we will get into someday because there is a whole other stuff yeah. and there's definitely a connection here. It can't be a coincidence that they both happen to be gunned down right. and they're like rivals, whatever. Um, death row security members, Michael Moore and Frank Alexander, both died under mysterious circumstances in 2013. Huh. In uh, May of 1998, Orlando Anderson and a friend got into a confrontation at a car wash with two other guys over a debt. A shooting breaks out and the three of them, oh, and three of them, including Orlando Anderson, are killed. The fourth man, Orlando's friend, Michael Lil Owl Doro, is then just convicted of all three murders and currently serving life in prison. 
which I love that like four of them are having like a shootout, three of them die, and they were just like, yeah, I guess he's guilty enough of all of them. Oh, God. Which is, again, we're going back to the prison system, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so going back to Biggie's murder and the task force that is currently running at this point in our story, there's a man by the name of Corey Edwards. He's a friend of Orlando's and was at the bar in Vegas when Orlando got beat down by Tupac. Corey claims that Orlando wanted revenge and that Corey had suggested just wait till we go back to Compton. Corey says uh, they waited for Tupac at Club 662. After an hour, they got bored, left for the hotel, but Orlando got in a car with some other guys to go looking for Tupac. The day after Orlando died, a gun was found in the backyard of Corey Edwards' girlfriend. The gun, I don't know how it was taken to police, but it was taken in uh, to evidence and tested, and the Compton PD verified it was the gun that killed Tupac Shakur. Shut up! I said that same thing, but less politely. <laughs> uh so, Ve but Vegas had the jurisdiction over the Tupac case because that's where it happened. Right. So Compton PD sent the gun to Vegas, who then went, oh, yeah, sorry, that's not the same gun. When asked later, Vegas claims they never received it at all. What? A confidential memo surfaced where the LAPD mentioned the gun and said, quote, don't say anything to Vegas. No word whether it's a legit document, but nowhere, no one has denied its authenticity. At the time of Tupac's death, Vegas was trying to brand itself as a family adventure vacation spot. They were yes. trying to make themselves like the new Disneyland. The last thing they wanted was a huge murder trial with a bunch of gang members that are coming in. Uh, they didn't want anyone wrecking this image that they were trying so hard to get. And so Vegas PD did not want a murder trial. Uh, we have officers who are like, I for sure sent that gun to them. And officers on the other side who are going, oh, we never got it. So... I have a lot of thoughts on that. I also liked the thought that the gun wasn't buried in any way. It was just like tossed in this backyard to the point where someone found it because a dog had picked it up and brought it to them because it found it just laying in the yard. And it's like the day after Orlando dies, a we the weapon used to kill Tupac just happens to appear in Orlando's best friend's backyard, girlfriend's backyard. What are the odds of that? So then it's like, did, did Orlando do it? And now they're like, well, now that he's dead, we can get rid of this. And then they can be like, great. It's obviously, this is the gun. It was probably him. He's dead. We let it go. Or uh -huh. did this Corey character do it and now has the perfect story to pin on his buddy Orlando because he's dead. I can confirm that Corey was in Vegas at the time of the shooting. I believe, and I don't have this written down in my notes right here, but I believe, and it'll go in like the virtual case file. Yeah. On truecrimeandcocktails.com. Check it out. Um, I believe I have the receipt from his hotel and of him staying the one night. And yes, I know it was a Tyson fight in the early nineties. Like that was probably the exciting thing to do. It's not far to go from like an LA to Vegas for a weekend. So to go for an overnight for the fight, sure. Everybody was there, but it's like, but the odds of this. Well, yeah. And also it's such a convenient story. Now I know that this is also like Keefe D's story is that it was this Orlando yeah. character. So I guess that is two people corroborating, but it is interesting to me that Corey is like, 
yeah, Orlando and I were together all night. We went yeah. to Club 662, waited, and then I was out. And he went on. He went and got in a car with some guys and went and killed Tupac. It's like, that's not how these things normally go. You don't normally split up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I also find it interesting since I, I believe that it went down very similar to what Keefe D says. But I think Keefe D put the gun in Orlando's hand because Orlando's dead now. So case closed. So right. I think potentially that or that Keefe D is protecting someone who is not dead, whether it was this Dre kid who cl- he claims said no, whether it was maybe instead of Dre in the car, maybe it was Corey Edwards. I don't know. I also find it hard to believe um, Dre was a larger gentleman and Orlando Jones was had to lean completely over him to get his hand outside the window. Mm. I don't know how easily that could have been done, but I like that we're talking about this because this is going to bring us right to the theories. And I know that people are like, but wait, there is still like, this is still like early in the episode to get to theories. These are going to take a while. So, (laughs) and listen, it ain't that early. (laughs) The joke is this would have been late for us already. Well, yeah, normally our episodes Back in the day. are over by now. So, <laughs> But in tw- not in 2021. 2021, 2020, we're like, maybe. we see two hours and we won't stop till we pass it, apparently. Yep. Yeah, yeah, we go, we go until we go. We go, yeah. in- we go until we go. We go where the case takes us. Yep. Carry on. Oh. My wayward son. No, thank you. Thank you. I'm not over it. I'm still mad. Nobody is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So number one theory, which I have to address because you cannot talk about Pac and now he's become Pac. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) You can't talk Pac without talking. Is he still alive? Yes. I don't know how this started. I've seen many, many photos that people have posted over the years that they're like, look at this guy. It's very clearly Tupac. Well, there is one guy uh, who seems to be in a bunch of photos in and around New York who very obviously dresses like him and got the same like piercing as he did, but he has none of Tupac's tattoos. And the eyelashes aren't the same because I know I've looked. Uh a weird thing to say um so no i don't believe he's still alive there is a guy who claims he helped tupac escape to cuba to just go live out the rest of his life right uh numerous people over the years in 2012 kim kardashian posted a picture of a man that she thought was tupac working at the airport I, I desperately want to believe that she was kidding and she could have been, but it's like, I don't think he faked his death to go work at LAX, you know, (laughs) like I, that feels don't think so. Yeah. If he was going to fake his death. Yeah. Go with the Cuba story. He would have gone somewhere, whatever, but he loved his mother and he left her behind and he was, According to Kadada, he was engaged to her at the time and he left her behind. So I don't truly believe that he faked his death. Yeah. Um, so I'm so sorry to all the Pac fans out there, but I don't believe he's still alive. I also think, you know, the concept of faking one's death, while not completely impossible, I don't yeah. think happens all that often. Maybe I'm yeah. wrong. People might come for me about that, but... But it is, I mean, it's quite a feat to actually pull off, right? Uh, Oh, yeah. Like a few years ago, I'm going to say within the last five to 10 years, I think. um, Again, names I never expect to say on this. Olivia Newton-John. Hello. Was dating a gentleman. He got on a boat and was lost at sea. 
and she was devastated for years and it was a whole thing and she had to like regroup and years later it comes out he was just trying to skip out on some debt (laughs) (laughs) he was found like in mexico or something living a whole new life and again i think that you can do that i just think he would have turned up by now don't you think 25 Um, years later yes because he was um he was very um what, a lot of the main stuff that he liked to speak out on um, was like racial injustice. Right. And I feel that the minute Black Lives Matter came out, he would have been like, yes, this is the thing. Let's let's get this. Let's use this momentum. And I don't think he would have just like bowed out and been like, they've got this. Yeah. And again, the friends and family he left behind, he had hopes of doing more acting um, I just, I don't believe it. And I, I know that like he took five bullets at one point and two of them were in the head and he survived. And then like uh, two years later, he takes four bullets and he dies. I get that that comp, like the math kind of doesn't work out and people just so desperately want to believe. And I get that they need, they want the hope because they desperately want him to be alive. But, um, that's going to get Christie's stamp. uh, Not true. Yeah. I also just think, you know, if when he was a 25 year old man and he thought this is a good idea to fake my own death, a lot of the decisions most of us made at 25 years later, I would say we maybe would be like, uh, not really happy about those decisions. Like, I just feel like he would have surfaced. I feel like at some point yeah. he would have been like, this is enough now. Like, you know, I, yeah, maybe I'm wrong. Who knows? But in the grand scheme of anything possibly being possible, sure. But yes, yeah. we are, we're, we're saying probably not. All right. Yeah. So who's next on the list here? So another theory is we go back to the East Coast, West Coast. Was Puffy involved? Mm. Uh, Bad Boy Records and Puffy felt very threatened by Suge and Death Row, um, going so far as to get extra protection whenever he was in California. Apparently, some of of Bad Boy Records people claim that they were beaten by Suge and Tupac and a bunch of their uh, bloods, I guess. Um, and asked for information on the location of Puffy's family when they stay in California. So he was terrified of the man, uh, and for good reason, (laughs) for good reason. I also heard he has a tank of piranha in his office where he just like threatens to like shove somebody's face into it when they piss him off. So he's just unsettling. So, um... But anytime you ask Puffy, he's just like, we don't talk about things that are nonsense. But I mean, to pull this off, I get that if he just asks the right people, it can happen. Is it possible he wanted Tupac gone? Was it possible that Suge was the actual target? Tupac got in the way. They did a terrible job, if that's the case. But if he took Tupac out, then that's going to destroy Death Row Records and suddenly there goes your competition. But if it gets back to Suge that you were involved in any way, he's going to take you out and you know it. So I can't decide if I think Puffy's involved, but I think Puffy is sketchy. Well, and there is, of course, also this Keefe character who's saying that he was offered a million dollars. Then, of course, this this million dollar outstanding debt from Puffy towards the Crips. Yeah. Or the concert thing. So, I mean, those do point in his favor. I got a little something I'm going to throw in the ring. Oh, yeah. So uh, Tupac's alleged fiance there, Rashida Jones' sister, her name again? Kadada. Thank you so much. Kadada claims Tupac's the love of my life. Yeah. But you said five months later after his death, she's seen partying with Puffy. She was at the Vibe party. That uh, was the party Biggie was at. And as he was leaving that party, he was shot. Her, was da- little- her dad was throwing the party like it was his 
company that threw the event. But that doesn't necessarily mean she has to be there. And if she has to be there, it doesn't mean you have to be grinding up on Sean P. Diddy Combs. Absolutely. And this is this is something that I was thinking as you were telling me all of this. This was where my, my wheels started turning. Yeah. Isn't it interesting and convenient that she had been dating Tupac for a very short amount of time? Mm-hmm. And then very shortly after his death, when he, she claimed to be in mourning, she was actually grinding on Puff Daddy, P. Diddy, whatever we want to call him. Yeah. Is it possible she was working with Puff Daddy and she was to alert him or whoever when they about were on the move, when they were leaving the hotel? She knew there was no way he was going to let her go because I'm sure that's common practice that it's like, either for your safety or because he wants to flirt with other girls. I mean, you, you said yourself that the car of girls pulled up and then they're like, come with us. So it's, I don't know that it was yeah. like Tupac was necessarily being altruistic and is wanting to protect Kadada. Yeah. I, you know what I, I'm saying? I've seen lists of women he was supposedly with fun fact. He dated Madonna for a brief time, huh? but then broke up with her because she was white. So he might not have been the best. Listen, he eventually um, felt bad about that and did take it back and was like, I, you know, sure. I shouldn't have said that. But to that point, also yes. keep in mind, the only reason that he and Kadata, or to, to our knowledge, a big part yes. of their relationship was because he called out Quincy Jones for having mixed children, Kadata being one of those mixed children, mm -hmm. and she conveniently falls in love with him and he's the love of her life. Isn't it possible that she may have a grudge against Tupac and perhaps would want to help Puffy? Sure. I mean, I it proved to me how young she was when she met him. When I saw an interview with her and she was talking about the day she met Tupac, and she said that he came over and he started apologizing and he was going on and he was telling me he was sorry about the things he said about my dad and about, you know, mixed race children. And I just sat there thinking, oh, is he cute? And I'm like, I don't know if that would have been the leap I took. But again, charismatic and for real, those eyelashes, you guys. <laughs> um, so Kidada... Also, um, after this whole thing came out of like him saying negative thing, Tupac saying negative things about Quincy Jones, um, Quincy Jones said, I don't care who you date, but Tupac is the one you won't be bringing home. So I feel she was like, oh, my dad doesn't approve. Cool. I love him. Love of my right. life. Right. So I think she almost like, brainwashed herself into thinking that he was going to be the perfect man. And who knows, maybe something was going on with Puffy at the time. You never know. She clearly knew him somehow. Yeah. But also in the video um, of her at the party, she they're dancing together. They're getting a bit close. She's dancing with other people. And then she turns to the camera and starts doing like gang signs. Because I guess that's just what you do when you're feeling badass. Which gang? West. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Especially when she's surrounded by East Coast guys. Or is that her like, look at me, I'm a badass. Because I'm actually West Coast mixing in with this. It's like, I, yeah. I, I don't know what her deal is. Right. I also don't feel like we can let Puffy off the hook because... I had no idea that Puffy was anywhere even in the realm of being possible in this, but I can't stop thinking he's connected somehow. Yeah. He has to be, right? I would think so. Yeah. I mean, because when Tupac died, it just, no pun intended, but Death Row Records kind of died as well. Like, yeah. it went nowhere. Um well, which leads us to another theory people have is the possibility was Suge involved somehow. Now, Hello. yes, he was sitting in the car right next to Tupac. It was very risky. Um, however, maybe 
he told them we're going to be at the club, hit us there. And the people jumped the gun, no pun intended, and shot early when they weren't supposed to. That's possible. Um, but also, Suge is like 6'4", 200, 300 pounds, and Tupac is like 5'11", 165. And they shot at that car 10 to 15 times and got Tupac four times and didn't get Suge at all. Like, I get that he was sitting a little bit further away, but it feels like things were more pointed at Tupac. I know people have right. suggested maybe Suge was the real target, but I feel like they, I just feel, it looks like it was aimed towards Tupac is my right. point. Right. But it's like, could Suge do this? Now, why would to, why would he want Tupac dead? Tupac was Suge's bread and butter. Right. There was a rumor going around that Tupac was looking to leave Death Row and start his own label, Machiavelli. Some say it was supposed to be linked to Death Row, but some say it was supposed to be linked to Quest Records, which was Quincy Jones' label. Which is like, oh, maybe because... If he's dating Quincy Jones' daughter, it would make sense that they maybe would strike up a thing where he's like, I want to go out on my own. And he's like, hey, I'd love to help you with that. Right. Because he was a huge moneymaker. So why wouldn't you want to help him? Yeah. So in the last weeks of his life, Tupac had been asking to see his financial statements from death row. And he was shot in early September in October, Death Row was supposed to pay Tupac a $4.5 million royalty check. And I'm not so sure they had the money. Uh, I also found the statement that showed what he owed. And it looks like the accountant did some like interesting work to make it seem like Tupac didn't, they didn't owe him as much because they took that $4.5 million and it whittled down with various charges and they, it said they only owed him like a million. Interesting. Mul multiple artists from Death Row have said, I didn't get paid when I was supposed to. A few have come forward and been like, anytime there was a discrepancy, he dealt with it. So I just feel it's like, who's willing to talk against Suge and who's not? Mm -hmm. So some were saying, the accountant was hiding money. Um, I don't believe that Suge actually had anything to do with Tupac's death. I think even if he knew if Tupac planned to leave at the time, um, Suge was, se he secretly had a 1961 Chevy Impala custom painted for Tupac with the cover of the album, Eyes on All Eyes on Me, airbrushed across the trunk. And the plan was to give this to him as a gift. He didn't get to give it to him because he died beforehand. But it's like, but then why would he have gone to all that trouble if he wasn't planning on him being around? Um, but also Tupac's death led to Suge's complete downfall. So he ended up filing for bankruptcy. And oh, yeah. Uh, the video of that fight, that little 12 second video, it shows Suge kicking at Orlando Jones. You don't know if he, or Orlando Anderson, sorry. You don't know if he actually like connected. He just, you see him swing his foot like he's going to kick him. And that's all you see from Suge as best you can. It's very grainy. Um, well, that single kick caused him to be found in violation of his parole. So he was sent to jail for nine years. Whoa. Now, my question is, where the fuck was his fancy lawyer then? Yeah, great question. Which brings me to, was the lawyer and other people in death row trying to take over death row and take it away from Suge Knight? So maybe Suge was the uh, target. Now, death row has this criminal defense attorney named David Kenner. He's described as ruthless. At one point in the early 90s, Snoop Dogg, who was part of Death Row, was on trial for murder. 
this David Kenner was his lawyer and somehow mysteriously evidence just disappeared and Snoop was acquitted. But a 12 second grainy ass video and his uh, and Suge goes to jail for nine years. No police report was ever filed for that fight. The video was given to police by David Kenner himself. Whoa. So is it possible that the lawyer was like, we want you gone. I want this company myself. There has been talk of like, was it Suge's estranged wife? Was she somehow involved to get the company to which she said, if I wanted it, I could have easily gotten it in the divorce. Or if I wanted, I could have left. And all the artists have since agreed if she left, we would have gone with her. Right. Because she was the more business minded one, whereas Suge was just, well, Suge be Suge. I'll say that. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what that means. Also, uh, two weeks before his death, Tupac fired David Kenner as his own lawyer. And when somebody heard that he had fired him, they said, well, that's your death then, I guess. Whoa. So like, maybe this David Kenner is more connected. We don't know if he had money, which I'm sure a criminal defense attorney of this level does. Maybe he just paid the right people. Who knows? Um, another option, we go back to the Crips and the Bloods. Orlando Anderson. Yeah. He did an interview on CNN with his lawyer. He said he didn't do it, but in the video, you can see in the moment where she's like, did you kill Tupac Shakur? And he's like, no. And you can see the one side of his mouth is trying not to smile. There is a sly little smile going on there. So one of the documentaries I watched showed the clip and brought in a body language expert who watched the interview and said, oh, he's hiding something. He can't maintain eye contact. He's hard swallowing. He's sly smiling. He knows more than he's saying. So it's like, of course he does, because Orlando is absolutely in here. There is something to me about the fact that Orlando happened to be in the lobby and Tupac sees him. Tupac didn't even see him. It was the guy who Orlando beat down who saw him, told Tupac, hey, there's that guy who beat me. And Tupac, for the sake of avenging a friend, goes in after him. But what are the odds he just happened to be standing there at that exact moment while they're walking past? I truly think that that is part of it, that he was put there so that there could be a fight. And then I don't know what they plan to happen after. Um, but in the 90s, drive-by shootings became the go-to method for gang retaliation. So, of course, Orlando's going to want to retaliate from getting beat down at MGM. Uh, or, like, just, I can't get past that Orlando happened to be in that lobby. I don't know if he was planted there. Was he somebody's patsy? Was someone like, you go there, they're going to fight you, you fight then have all right to follow them and take them out. I don't know. One author uh, claimed that Death Row Records has an accounts payable file marked OA, potentially Orlando Anderson. Interesting. I could find nothing else on that, so I don't know for sure on that. But again, that I find fascinating because yeah. I think Orlando is involved in this in some way. Oh, for sure. Um, I find it super convenient that after his death, his uncle, Keefe D, is suddenly willing to admit that Orlando did it. Uh, two cops who are part of the Compton PD gang unit at the time said, yeah, after it happened, all the rumors going around where it was, were saying it was Orlando. And I believe that and the detect one of the detectives said, and this is going to become um, 
a motto. If it was, if it was shorter, I'd get it tattooed across my knuckles. Oh, I wouldn't. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. Yeah. It's not what you know. It's what you can prove. <laughs> Again, would, I, you need more fingers for sure. I don't know. It would have to be on the palms of my hand. I can't do that. No, I, no. I, again, I, Brandy and I are having a good time. But if you put a one little tiny word, it would fit on your fingers. It's not what you know. It's (laughs) what you could prove. Well, don't, don't tempt me now. I don't know if I could Ah! go through with it, but let me tell you, it's been several years since I've had a tattoo and I kind of miss it. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh God, this is, speaking of Vegas, I can, I smell where this is going when the world opens up again. Um, Make it longer enough after this that I've forgotten this deep love I currently have for Tupac. So I don't make a weird mistake. Oh yeah. You know, I don't need you covering Tupac's name with roses in five years or something. That's the joke. It wasn't his name. It was his portrait. Oh dear God. She had like a three, four inch tall portrait of him on her shoulder and she got it covered. They only dated for three months, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, keep in I mind- I love that response. That's, yeah. that's how she felt about him. I don't know how he felt about her. When you ask like the security guys that were in and around them, he they're like, oh yeah, I remember seeing her, but she wasn't there that much. I think she was barely there a couple of months, maybe. And then it's like, oh, well, they said uh, they're engaged. She said they were engaged. They're like, oh, that's news to me. So again, I don't know if they were, but also I never saw a ring. Who knows? Maybe it was as simple as one night he told her, yeah, yeah, I'll be with you forever. And that's all it took. You never know when you're younger. Sure. It takes very little before you're like, oh. He loves me so much. And then he's like, oh, you like hockey? We're done. <laughs> <laughs> Bringing it back. All um, right. Listen, I, we do, gotta- I do also want to point out quickly because there have been some negative things about Tupac that I said, but I just want to say in the last years, few years of his life, completely like anonymously and so that no one would like because he wanted no one to find out about it. He had been financing an at-risk youth center. He was bankrolling South Central sports teams and setting up a telephone helpline for young people with problems. Huh, did he have guilt over the things he's done, you think? He He, he had, well, probably, but he had a very rocky childhood. Mm -hmm. His mother has openly admitted that she had a very serious cocaine addiction. Oh. And at one point he had to leave and go live with friends. And then at he goes to this performing arts school, really finds that he's loving it. He's just like, uh, he was a poet and all of this. And this woman, he was a natural talent. And this middle-aged white woman was like, oh my God you're going to be something. So she like took him into her home and she like got him into the music industry. And so I think if it wasn't for some of these people, he would never have even become what he did, but that does not excuse the things that he did do. And I would like to go back just in case, because I feel like I didn't hit on it. The uh, assault case he was involved in where I was like, well, there was no evidence and the witnesses all saw it. They saw, you know what? Again, I am a strong believer in believing women. Yes. So if she said things went down, um, I believe something happened. I don't know what, but he said later that he felt bad about it. He felt guilt because he said, I never should have left her alone in there with anybody. But at the time he, he, his excuse was, I figured if I go and tell them like, no, go get out of here. It then suddenly makes it like, she's my girl. And I didn't want it to look like that. And it's like, or you were just being a nice human. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So no. problematic. Yes, there are yeah, things, absolutely but uh, 
Yeah. Um, all right. Well, listen, we got to, we got to get these things wrapped up, but, uh, yeah. you know, do you have a theory at the end of the day? Like, where do you lie on all of this? I think that Keefe D is at the very least, I think he's telling at least a partial truth. Yeah. The way he talks about it. I know he only gave that interview to save himself from a life in prison, Yeah. but I think he truly, there's something about his story. I think Orlando was involved. I don't know if he was the shooter or not, but it's just too convenient that he dies and suddenly the, the gun magically shows up. But I think that Keefe D was telling the truth about who was in the vehicle. And then I think there may have been somebody else who was the shooter and he's covering for them by saying, oh yeah, it was Orlando. Because if Orlando was alive right now and he gave that interview, would he still put it on Orlando? Good That's question. The question. But well, but then on the other side of it, I mean, if what he is saying is true and Orlando came back, back home to Compton and was bragging to everybody that he killed Tupac and then he gave yeah. his gun to his friend Corey and was like, hide this for me. And then the day after he died, Corey was like, don't need this anymore. Or even, you know, maybe he was like, if I die, you know, let people find this. Like maybe, maybe Orlando wanted credit for Tupac's death. Cause it seemed like he was trying Without to get doing the time. Yeah, exactly. Um, only other thing I think that is a huge red flag yeah. is, and I agree with you, you, you said it already, but I want to say it again. Why was he in that lobby at that moment? It seems way too random. I hear you. It could be a coincidence. I don't buy that. Was yeah. he planted there by Puffy? Was he planted there by this weird shady lawyer character? Mm -hmm. That one almost feels like, it almost feels to me like there could there could have been a multiple people hired to kill Tupac. Who knows? Yes. There could have been people waiting at the club that never got the chance. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and B, but B, it feels like there could have been multiple things going on at the same time here because it feels like this lawyer had a real horse in the race to try yeah. and get something to pin on Suge Knight. So it feels like I could buy that it was like, hey, I'm gonna pay you to go start a fight with these guys or whatever, so I could get footage to then, you know what I mean? I and buy he that. would he would know the story, right? And know if if Trayvon Lane is gonna be going with him, right? He would know what Orlando looks like, whereas Tupac wouldn't know who the hell that was, right? So yeah. But again, also, it could have also been Puffy because oh, Puffy knew him all about that too. I think Puffy absolutely was somehow involved because it was like yeah. he was being terrorized. He didn't want to even go to the West Coast because of Shug. And it was like, all you have to do, you take out that one little piece of Jenga and the whole fucking tower falls down, right? So yeah. you took him out. He also... Uh, was pissing off your main talent at the time, which was Biggie. Right. And so, yeah, I think Puffy was somehow involved. I really do. It does feel like, again, I feel like it's, there's a possibility that there was lots of different people involved to lots of different degrees and lots of different degrees of success. You know, I, I yeah. think it's more than possible that there could have been a lot of people that wanted him dead. I mean, clearly we've, we've gone through them. It, yes. <laughs> and I think... It's also uh, the police department that were just like, ah, we're good. Yeah. Yeah. Like which is... you, you find the gun, you're like, oh, this is it. And they're like, nah, let's not. We're like well, Disneyland, bring your families here. I wonder it's who like, would also have a connection mm -hmm. to the police. Would it be a very powerful criminal defense lawyer? Oh, now who, you're talking. Who's made evidence disappear before? Okay. Come on. I just put that together. Yeah. Well, that's why that's why we do this. That's why we do this. And you I think, think there's... in exchange, he would help them become the new Disneyland. That's all <laughs> that's all Vegas wanted. But it's I know. like I know I've never been to Vegas, but I don't know how family but they no they tried is. to do that for a period of time and it failed yeah. and then it was after that period of time that they launched the what happens in vegas stays oh. in vegas 
Yeah, they realized that it was like, this is pointless. It's not working. Let's just turn into the swerve of the debauchery. So maybe, but maybe Las Vegas had nothing to do with it at all. Maybe it was all about this this criminal defense attorney who wanted Tupac's murder to go away. That didn't help his ultimate goals, right? Yeah. Oh, I, I'm i going to say this is the most professional thing I've said on a case. I think he's our guy. <laughs> if okay, I wait. may. Yeah. We got our scumbag! <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right? I will I will also take um I really like David Kenner for this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I don't know why I was like, you know what's going to really punctuate that sentence? Getting deeper. <laughs> I don't going into this voice. I don't know who this is. <laughs> This is Brandy the next morning is who this is with that voice. Um, But yeah, yeah. And then my question is just who did he have shoot? I feel like he absolutely had like a full group. I mean, there's so many, it could have been, I mean, it could have still been Orlando. It could have been somebody that we, we don't even know about. It could have been that there was a group of people so that it could have been pinned on anybody. I mean, who knows? Like, especially when Keefe's response was, I would have done it for 50. It's like, if you would have done it for that low, he could have probably paid a hundred grand to like, to um, split it amongst a group and been like, well, there you go. And then the next time you need help with something, I'll maybe help you out. Cause he's this powerful lawyer who also wore a death row records medallion. Interesting. Yeah. Well, listen again, this is all conjecture. Please don't come for us. Okay. We're just <laughs> two gals that are talking late at night. All right. It's uh, we're not, we, we have nothing to back this up. Okay. We don't even pass our info on to the police, even if we had it. So we're, we're good. fine. Okay. We're fine. Yeah. Um, Chrissy Oxborough out of the park exceptional work this was fabulous I really I didn't know any of this and I feel like the bits that I did know I had completely forgotten because this had been yeah. gone on so long ago so this was a real treat it was and I'm gonna say it it was a fucking joy <laughs> I um again I don't know why I felt so passionate about him and this case in particular I mean he died in 96 I think I was still in mourning from Kurt Cobain's death (laughs) two years before. So, which we'll get to, but again, that one's going to be difficult for me. So I'm not, I'm just not ready yet. But um, I just think there was something about it. And again, I went into this knowing very little. I was like, he did that Janet Jackson movie. He sang California love and he was a rapper, I guess. And that was all I knew And so I learned so much about him and there's just so much. And he was so beloved and still is. And yeah, he still is. It's just, uh, it's just, there's so much. And I didn't expect it to be so much, but it's now inspired me to want to suggest a biggie case at some point, because I have some strong feelings about that too. Absolutely. I think down the line in this season, we're absolutely going to have to cover the biggie case. Uh, Dear listeners, we hope you enjoyed this right now we're going to go and record a last call and you're like what's a last call well it's a bonus episode of true crime and cocktails that you can get if you subscribe to our patreon so go to patreon.com slash true crime and cocktails to learn all about how you can subscribe and get all kinds of more content from these two dingalings uh again if if over two hours uh isn't enough for you Um, thank you and uh we look forward to seeing you over there where we have a great time there's lots of fun bonuses we do episodes with guest stars we do private q a's it's a whole lot of fun and we hope to see you um christy do you want to say goodnight to the people um well i think before i say that i was gonna tease our next episode yes now this is probably the case that we have been asked to do more than any other case yeah We have had more fan requests from you, dear listeners, for this case than any other. Yeah. And I'm very excited because I know 
next to nothing about it. Oh, see, so this is, this is I'm going to be shine. Oh yeah. I'm looking yeah, at this yeah. with fresh eyes. So I'm excited about it and I can't wait. Well, listen, yeah. Do the honors. Oh, well. On the next True Crime and Cocktails, Jean Benet Ramsey. We'll see you then. <laughs>